<coughs> order members, the next item of business is the final stage of the Executive Committee Function Spill. The Speaker has received a letter from the Secretary of State saying, sign, uh, signifying that he is content to grant consent for the bill to enter its final stage. I call Junior uh, Minister uh, uh, Gordon Lyons to move the final stage. I beg to move that the Executive Committee Functions Bill do now pass. Thank you. The final stage of the Executive Committee Functions Bill has been moved. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on the debate. And I call the Junior Minister to open the debate on the motion. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Executive Committee Functions Bill will provide greater clarity for Ministers as to the circumstances in which they must refer matters to the Executive Committee for agreement. In particular, it provides an exemption from referral to the Executive Committee for certain decisions taken by the relevant Minister under the Planning Act 2001. The Bill is not concerned with the detail of the planning process, but instead seeks to clarify who is responsible for making decisions. Section 20 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 states that the Executive Committee provides a forum for the discussion of and agreement on issues which cut across the responsibilities of two or more ministers. The Executive Committee additionally has the function of discussing and agreeing upon significant or controversial matters that are clearly outside the scope of the programme for government. These functions are also reflected in the obligation placed on ministers to bring certain matters to the Executive Committee under paragraph 2.4 of the Ministerial Code. It is important to note that the Bill does not seek to change either the obligations on ministers to refer to the Executive Committee or the role of the Executive Committee in considering cross-cutting matters. It does, however, seek to address the implications of the Buick Judgment informed by the legal advice of the Departmental Solicitor's Office and the Attorney-General, which, as members will be aware, related to the decision of the Department for Infrastructure to approve a planning application for a waste disposal incinerator in Molusk in 2017. The Bill addresses the implications of the judgments in the following ways. Firstly, the Bill fully protects and maintains the requirement of Section 20 of the Northern Ireland Act that any matter that is significant or controversial must continue to be brought to the executive. However, it further clarifies that this requirement is also on ministers, even if there is no programme for government in place. This means that the absence of a programme for government, for whatever reason, cannot be used as a reason for not referring a matter uh, to the executive committee for decision. This is the purpose of Clause 1 uh, 2, and this not only protects but enhances uh, the St Andrews uh, Agreement. In relation to the implications of the wider definition of cross-cutting, this had been interpreted as applying only to matters which cut across the statutory responsibilities of two or more ministers, and did not encompass those in which they simply had an interest, although the matter might, as in this case, be supportive of other ministers' aims or objectives. This judgment means that the range of matters which would require referral to the executive could be widened substantially, with the inherent difficulty of measuring the extent and nature of the interest which another minister might have in the matter. It could also undermine the executive authority of individual ministers within their areas of responsibility. Specifically, it means that planning decisions, which were considered the sole responsibility of the relevant minister and were not referred to the Executive Committee for agreement, would henceforth need to be so to remove the risk of legal challenge on the cross-cutting principle. This would make the Executive Committee the de facto planning authority rather than the Minister for Infrastructure in whom the statutory power is actually vested. The Bill addresses this implication by providing that a Minister does not need uh, to refer to the Executive Committee uh, a matter where the effect on another Minister's statutory functions is only incidental. For example, a statutory requirement um, for one Minister to consult another would not be considered to affect the exercise of statutory responsibilities more than incidentally. 
This reflects the practical application of the cross-cutting requirement by the Executive since St Andrews, but prior to the Buick case. Finally, to place the responsibility for planning decisions beyond doubt, the Bill provides an exemption from referral to the Executive of certain decisions made by the Department or Minister for Infrastructure under the 2011 Planning Act or regulations or orders made under the Act. The Bill therefore seeks to bring into statute the implications of the Buick judgment in respect of the programme for government, while providing much needed clarification to Ministers on the extent of their obligations to the Executive Committee. This will preserve an appropriate degree of ministerial authority while placing reasonable limits on the extent to which ministerial decisions, including essential planning decisions, could be challenged on grounds that they are cross-cutting. I commend the bill to the House. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, sir. And I do not intend to detain the House very long because the arguments around this piece of legislation are well rehearsed and were uh, discussed at length yesterday in the Chamber. I think that everyone can recognise that the advances that were made at St Andrews represented an enormous improvement upon how this part of the United Kingdom is governed. I think it was an important principle that the government should function collectively and in a spirit of cooperation. And the changes that were made uh, as a consequence of the efforts of the Democratic Unionist Party at St Andrews uh, facilitated that positive change to how this part of our country is governed. This proposal is completely consistent with St Andrews, and it is important that that is noted. We have had arguments thrashed out between differing interpretations. Government acts on advice, legal advice given to it by, amongst others, the Attorney General and the Departmental Solicitor's Office. That is why they are there. That is why the office, or one of the reasons why the Office of Attorney General exists, and it is one of the reasons why the Departmental Solicitor's Office exists. Members over the course of recent days have questioned the advice that has been given by both those uh, organs of the state. That is their right in a democracy to do that. But what I would say is that if we are questioning the validity of that advice, then effectively what we are saying is that we should abolish those offices. Because what is the point of their existence if uh, we simply decide we prefer the advice of someone else outside of no. We prefer the advice of someone else no. Yes, I am not petrified of you, Mr. Order, Wells. Order. <laughs> you believe that if you want to. The consistent uh, position of those who have, have opposed accelerated passage of the bill, speaking of which, I will give way to Ms. Woods. For forgiving way, will the member agree with me that not all members of this House have had sight of the legal advice that he is referring to? Absolutely, and that is standard custom and practice in government. The legal advice, even, even those who served as ministers would be able to attest to the fact that the legal advice that they are given is not uh, publishable. And I will accept criticism of the accelerated passage procedure from Ms Woods. I will accept it from Mr Carroll or from Mr Alistair or from Ms Bailey, because they were the only four members of this House who have maintained a consistent position on this issue. So they were opposed to accelerated passage from the very start, and I accept and acknowledge their right so to be. I'll give way to Mr Wells now. Uh, would Mr Stolford accept that the very same legal advisers gave advice to the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment on the RHI scheme, and that advice was found to be very, very wanting indeed? If Mr Wells wishes to take to his feet in the chamber and consistently denigrate the professionalism and the standards of the Departmental Solicitor's Office, that is his right. 
I am merely pointing out that both the DSO and the Attorney General exist, exist as organs of this state to advise uh, members. The provisions that the junior minister has outlined actually strengthen the concept of collective responsibility because they provide clarity around um, the areas which are defined as significant, controversial or cross-cutting. And that is important because this is an issue that members will be aware has been argued out in the courts on numerous occasions. So if provisions are being put in place that provide clarity, I mean that we don't have a situation whereby, as has had to happen in the past, we don't have a situation whereby ministers in the same executive end up on opposing sides in a court case. I think that's something that should be welcomed because it encourages the smoother and more effective operation of our government. It encourages ministers to work together. It encourages people to act in a collaborative fashion. And that was the, the vision of St Andrews, a collective government. I think that it's important also to note that under these provisions, ministers will not be able, and members know this, ministers will not be able to go off on so-called solo runs as happened in the past. Any decision under these provisions, any decision that is deemed to be significant, controversial or cross-cutting, if a minister unilaterally assumes the power upon themselves to take such a decision, that decision is not valid. It has no standing because of the provisions that has been outlined by the junior minister. Let's envisage a situation, Mr Stolford, where we have a pro-choice Minister for Health who is exercising his authority in a way that is repugnant to many members of this House. How does we bring his activities or her activities to the executive? For it to be significant or controversial, the matter has to be clearly outside the ambit of the, PA, the programme for government. And for it to be cross-cutting, under the old law, it's very clear, it has to be brought to the executive. But under the new law, unless it's affecting significantly any other department, it can't be brought before the executive. Now, abortion is a very controversial issue, but it's very difficult to see how it affects anything significantly on the work of the Department of Agriculture. Department of Infrastructure or the Department of the Economy. So it fails those two tests. How do you bring something that many members in this assembly and many executive members find utterly repugnant, how do you bring that to executive under your legislation? Under the remit of the Department of Justice. I think it's important that any decision, no, I've been very generous and the member accused me of being terrified to give way to him. I think I've given way now three times, certainly twice, and I was very generous with him yesterday as well. Any decisions taken outside uh, by a minister outside the scope of these provisions will not be valid and will not have force, and that is clear to anyone who seeks to read them. In conclusion, therefore, sir, the arguments have been well rehearsed. Indeed, some of those who uh, were protesting yesterday that there hadn't been enough scrutiny for a three-clause bill, I think the assembly, one of which was the t is the title, I think the Assembly has exercised a very decisive level of scrutiny over this particular piece of legislation. The arguments have been thrashed out, and I think that it's important that we move forward together. Thank you. I call Pat Sheehan. over the last and uh, I agree with the previous speaker that all the arguments have been rehearsed and ventilated uh, in this chamber over uh, uh, a number of debates. Uh, and I'm not going to detain the House too long, just to reiterate uh, where we came from and, and how we have arrived at this point. The Buick judgment, which no one expected, uh, has made the potential for uh, people bringing the executive or ministers uh, to court 
uh, is, is uh, an ever-present danger in the current, in the context of the Buick judgment. That needs to be changed. There is no point in ministers ending up in court over practically every decision that is made. So what this uh, bill does, and as has been pointed out, uh, it is a very short piece of legislation. But what it does it, is that it recalibrates the legislation back to what everyone believed it was prior to the Buick judgment. Uh, the safeguards are there. If a uh, decision is significant, controversial, or genuinely cross-cutting, then uh, it is for the executive to deal with it. Uh, that's, that seems to be absolutely clear, the advice from the the Departmental Solicitor's Office and the Attorney General is crystal clear. I'll give way, yes. Let's go move to another situation. One of your ministers is responsible for infrastructure. He decides to implement Irish language road signs throughout Northern Ireland. Clearly, that is entirely within the ambit of the functions of his or her department. And unless there's a policy forbidding it in the programme for government, how does that policy go on to the executive table? What is to stop his minister simply proceeding to introduce Irish language signs throughout Northern Ireland? That would arrive at the executive because it touches upon two departments, infrastructure and communities. Uh, and uh, thanks for both interventions. Uh, I think uh, in, in the case of Mr Wells, his uh, intentions here or to spook the horses. Uh, it's simply that. And the, the, the question once answered clearly, I don't have to answer it myself. So uh, we need we needed accelerated passage. This has been an issue, and I and I accept that some members here are opposed to accelerated passage. As a general principle, and, and I accept that it doesn't accelerated passage doesn't allow for the uh, depth of scrutiny that would normally be the case. However, in this situation, we are in a crisis situation. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, that has, of course, affected the, the health of our citizens, but a consequence of that has been the damage to the economy. We need to get the economy going. And one aspect where we can do that is with major infrastructure projects. They are sitting in the infrastructure minister's in-tray it is probably overflowing at the minute, and we need to get those going, get people back to work, get the construction industry back to work. And, uh, for that reason, I uh, will be supporting uh, this bill. Gormavid. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. And I rise to continue to support this bill. It is a sensible one that will allow, amongst other things, the Minister for Infrastructure to uh, make and take decisions. And these are not small decisions. They will be about regional applications that will de deliver jobs, they will boost the economy, and they will get the North's economy moving again. We have coronavirus and we have Brexit. And these combined have had a major impact upon the economy. And when the economy is in a bad way, our communities are in a bad way. Your less jobs means less money in our communities. And this has ramifications that go beyond the mere planning applications. The bill will also help the executive to work better, to stop paralysis. And time and time again, door after door, election after election, the people told us, get up there and do your work. Do your job, is what we were told. And how many years have gone by and people can struggle to try and think of decisions that have actually been taken here that truly positively impact their lives. Now, there will be significant and controversial decisions. I have already mentioned Brexit uh, as one, and these decisions may create division. Different approaches uh, will be difficult to unite. But the procedures are there to call in such matters and to help the executive to search for the consensus and the compromise to ensure that delivery takes place. To me and us, this bill is about action. It's about getting things done. It's about delivering for people and delivering for communities. 
Some may not like to cede a little power. Some may not like to devolve a little bit of decision-making. And some may whiff a few stray votes in the air and think that that might be a little bit more that's happening here than having any problems with the bill. But I want to see action. I want to see activity. I want to see autonomy where appropriate. And I want to see this place delivering for people and truly serving people's needs by helping them and by us doing our job. I am happy to support this bill and look forward to seeing it passed here today. I call Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, it, it is a short bill, um, but it is a far-reaching bill. Um, so I don't think we should really look at the how many pages or how many clauses, but what effect it has. I thought yesterday was a good debate. Um, I, I think it was an important debate, and uh, I think people got their point uh, across well. And I won't be rehearsing um, any of that from yesterday because the outcome was quite clear, and I accept. Uh, what that outcome was. But I have to say, Mr Speaker, um, during the debate, debate yesterday, uh, I did have to bite my lip somewhat uh, when I was accused of being uh, insulting, uh, when my moral integrity uh, was questioned, when MLAs uh, made the assertion that 11 minutes scrutiny in a committee was good enough, or, or when members um, uh, questioned the whole planning piece of the bill but absolutely ignored my amendments. How dare I change my mind? How dare I, as an MLA, say, actually, I got it wrong and I've changed my mind? How dare I question a bill which is a carve-up between two parties? How dare I? Mr Speaker, when I do these debates on important matters like this, I genuinely try to hold the hand of friendship out to everybody here and listen to the point they're trying to make. I genuinely try. But let me make it clear. Do not confuse friendship with weakness. This bill is bad legislation. And there are people in this assembly who know it's bad legislation and they're still going to vote for it. Shame on them. It has not been scrutinised to the level that it should have been. MLAs have not had the opportunity to question all of the experts in regards to this. We do not know the effects of this legislation in the medium to long term. No idea. It will create a combative executive. When pretty petty decisions are made outside of the executive, it will allow other ministers to do a pylon. And that is dysfunctional government. It will allow ministers to step outside of collective government to get themselves away from any controversial decisions that are being made. This bill is a DUP U-turn on their core arguments on the reasons why they said to their electorate they could share office with Sinn Féin. As St Andrews, the DUP said they fixed the Belfast Agreement and stopping ministers and going on solo runs was one of the core tenets for them saying they had fixed that Belfast Agreement. And yet here they are doing a U-turn and backtracking on that very principle. The Ministerial Code of Conduct 2.4 is nearly a direct extraction from the St Andrews Agreement. Nearly a direct extraction. And yet 2.4, designed to keep the bar low for cross-cutting measures, is going to be overturned. And I'm in no doubt whatsoever after the summer recess that we will have the ministerial code before this assembly and 2.4 is going to be changed. The minister's assertion that every minister now is stuck in this quandary because of Buick, that they have to bring all decisions before the executive, is just not true. We've had an executive for six months and ministers did not bring all of the issues before the executive. 
In fact, the health minister reduced, reduced the ban on gay and bisexual men giving blood from one year to three months. He didn't bring it before the executive, and not a single minister raised an issue about that. But it could be viewed as being controversial, controversial enough for DUP ministers previously to take it to court. So it's a fallacy to say for the last six months we have been running contrary to the Buick judgment. So that raises the question. And it is the prime question that has never been answered yet. Why are we rushing this through? What is behind the rushing through of this legislation? Somebody needs to answer and say, this is why we had to do it. Because if we were able to operate for six months with ministers making decisions outside of the executive, why do we now have to rush it through? Well, certainly will. That is a question that's been asked by so often in the chamber yesterday. And it's the one question that... Order, order, could I ask the member to speak in front of the microphone so everyone can hear? It, that question was asked by so many speakers yesterday. It's the one question that was evaded on every occasion by the proponents of this bill. What would be wrong in parking the final stages of this bill until October to allow a cool-headed reflection on its implications? And I'm perfectly happy if Mr Lands or Mr Stolford or anyone else will stand up and say, why the rush? Why did it have to be handled this way? And if they don't answer that question, I'm afraid many of us have deep suspicions as to what's going on. Silence. I thank the, uh, the, the member for the intervention, and, and it is key. It, it is a really important point, and I, and I hope the junior minister can address that for us uh, when he winds on this. I mean, it's uh, whoever's winding, sorry, because um, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly important. But here's my belief. My belief that this is a dangerous carve-up between the DUP and Sinn Féin aided and abetted by some of the other parties without looking into this in any depth. And I think they're doing this because they want to distance themselves from some controversial issues which are about to come before the executive. No, I'll not. Sit down. Take your medicine. There is absolute... So I think there is controversial issues coming before the executive, and they will try to distance themselves from it. The Armed Forces Commissioner, the Irish Language Commissioner, abortion legislation. Just watch till you see people die for cover when they start coming out as they try to hide and distance themselves from that. There is not a chance that I will be supporting this legislation. Not a chance my party will be supporting this leg legislation. But every chance in the future, I will be pointing out the folly of this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call Andrew Muir. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, my party will be voting for the bill today. This bill gives the Minister for Infrastructure the power to take planning decisions, as was always the intention. Yes. Giving way. Uh, no matter how intemperate or ranting Mr. Beattie chooses to be, the fact of the matter is that when he says aided and abetted by some parties, go and look at the result of the division yesterday. I think it was 73 members to 10. So when you talk about aided and abetted by, when Mr. Beattie talks about aided and abetted by other parties, I suggest he goes and does some basic mathematics. Thank you very much, Mr. Stafford. I do find Rather strange, the argument from Mr Beattie that it's a DUP and Sinn Féin carve-up to give power to other ministers, including the three smaller parties. Something new and revealing, perhaps. Um, this bill uh, allows ministers to take decisions that are not cross-cutting, that are within their sole statutory authority, and that are not significant or controversial, without the need to bring them to the Executive Committee first. Without this legislation, the Executive Committee would become the de facto planning authority for Northern Ireland. The Minister for Infrastructure only deals with regionally significant and called in planning applications. Therefore, if all significant decisions have had to come to before the Executive Committee, then it would follow that all the Minister's planning decisions would fall into that category. Having the Executive Committee responsible for all regionally significant planning decisions would only make the current delays in the system worse. Yesterday, Mr Wells stated, there is no huge stack of applications waiting to be processed. 
To clarify, on 15 June, the Infrastructure Minister confirmed to me a list of applications still to be determined, extending to 38 applications, with the top two stuck in the system for 698 weeks and 695 weeks. Yes. Making a valid point. There are 38 applications in the system. How many of those would be determined before October if we decided to put a halt to the consideration of this bill to allow for cool heads to sit down and think through its, its implications? Given the fact we're in a COVID-19 crisis, given the fact that we're in the middle of the holiday period, will any of those 38 applications be affected if we have the temerity to sit down and have a long, hard look at what we're about to do? Um, I thank the member for his intervention. It will be for the Infrastructure Minister to clarify what decisions can be made over the weeks and months ahead. But I know that after three years of no government in Northern Ireland, in the middle of an economic crisis, we can ill afford to wait even further. The people of Northern Ireland, as uh, the other member uh, outlined, have been saying to us to get back to work, get decisions made. And the message we're getting from today is delay. Think about it. I think we've done enough thinking about things here in Northern Ireland. We need to start taking decisions. The facts in relation to the delays around planned applications and those needing to be determined speak for themselves. It was always the attention that decisions uh, it would fall under the powers of the relevant planning minister. It is my opinion that this legislation takes us back to the position that all parties had accepted before the Court of Appeal's judgment on the Buick case. As the judgment states, no previous environment minister or infrastructure minister had ever referred an individual plan and application to the Executive Committee for agreement prior to its determination. In addition, Mr Deputy Speaker, this legislation will go some way to allow ministers to make decisions that are neither significant nor controversial and are their, their sole statutory responsibility and are not cross-cutting without having to refer it to the Executive Committee. Legal opinions are just that. They are opinions. I have heard one that the cross-cutting element will be largely unaltered as a result of this legislation, with the Infrastructure Minister again able to determine regionally significant applications, essentially pre-Buick, post-St Andrews. I have read other opinions on social media, contrary to this, but ultimately the decision is to be made as whether this legislation is the best response to the Court of Appeal's Buick ruling. I feel it does strike the right balance between necessary collective decision-making and granted ministers the power to make judgments and know that from reading the judgment on the Buick that the failure to act would lead to not only unnecessary ministerial inertia but successful legal challenges that Northern Ireland can ill afford. We can't afford to ignore Buick. We have got to act. However, I have raised the issue with regards to the wording of the ministerial code and that it will also need to be updated to reflect the provisions of the legislation before us today. The Ministerial Code is a very necessary piece of the statute book designed to hold ministers to account for their actions. It is important that it is updated in line with the legislation if passed today, so that it continues to be an active document that reflects the law of the land rather than a set of alternative rules that unnecessarily adds to legal uncertainty. However, I would seek clarity from the ministers in their response as to whether planning decisions can be made before the Code is updated. Mr Deputy Speaker, how ministers and the Executive Act, individually and collectively, is the most important factor in whether these institutions can survive and regain the trust of the people of Northern Ireland. On planning, we need ministers who will objectively apply planning policy uh, when making their judgments. Around the Executive, we need ministers who work together collaboratively to deal with the significant and controversial issues that need to be tackled. This is what I believe today's legislation allows for, but ultimately it will be up for the ministers themselves to make it work. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Matthew Toole. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, as many uh, speakers have said, particularly the member for Upper Ban, um, this bill, the length of this bill is in inverse proportion to its importance. It is, first of all, worth saying, as um, everyone has said, that uh, we need a legal remedy to the precedent created by the Buick judgment. That judgment created an enormous uncertainty in our planning process, leading to stasis in our planning system 
uh, which added to a broader policy stasis and decision-making stasis within our politics and public sector. And we need, a planning, we need that planning process to be working effectively, particularly in order to make decisions that will be vital to our economic recovery. And that point has been uh, emphatically and well made um, by members from multiple parties. In short, the Infrastructure Minister needs to be able to make decisions, uh, and this bill achieves that. Um, Andrew Muir outlined the volume of decisions that are in front of the Planning Minister. But that is not to say that this bill or the process surrounding it have been ideal. Since reforming this Assembly, we have more than once been asked to compress our scrutiny and to grant accelerated passage to legislation which in normal times would and should receive more attention, including multiple budget bills. Therefore, agreeing to accelerated passage of this bill was far from ideal, and I say that in full um, recognition that I wasn't here to speak against it whenever it was first debated. I, like Mr Beattie, am happy to uh, acknowledge where uh, I, I, I should have spoken up earlier about a process not being ideal. Um, I'm happy to take anyone's criticisms today about not speaking up. I don't think it's um, completely ideal that a bill like this uh, receives a compressed uh, level of scrutiny. Uh, it is, however, welcome uh, that once passed, this legislation will enable planning decisions to be made promptly after years of uncertainty, and for that reason I and my party are supporting it. But, as I raised yesterday, I am keen in doing so that we have clarity from the Executive Office on one particular area of concern, uh, and that is the issue of Brexit and, in particular, the implementation of the Ireland Protocol. Clauses 8 and 9 of this Bill have been the subject of particular controversy and on their face appear to give much more sweeping power to individual ministers to make decisions without reference to the Executive Committee. Uh, the Bill retains the provision that significant or controversial matters must be brought before the Executive. Uh, we do not yet have sight of the updated Ministerial Code, which has been mentioned frequently, and this document, as others have said, will need to provide real clarity on how the provisions in this updated Bill interact with the responsibilities of executive ministers. As I said yesterday, if any issue qualifies as fundamental and cross-cutting and significant and controversial, it is Brexit and the implementation of the protocol. The minister, the junior minister, helpfully confirmed to me yesterday that the executive and its Brexit committee remains core to dealing with Brexit-related matters. Uh, though I have been disappointed and critical with the level of scrutiny this Assembly has been able to do on the subject of both Brexit and specifically the implementation of the protocol, indeed very frustrated. I was glad and grateful for that from the Minister. The New Decade New Approach document references the importance of Brexit by setting up a Brexit subcommittee. Indeed, that is now a, a straightforward executive committee with representation from all parties. So, as we give our support today for the intentions of this bill, with, care, with my own careful caveats about frustration at accelerated passage and acknowledgement that there are legitimate criticisms uh, of this bill, uh, and indeed acknowledging uh, much of what uh, Mr Beattie has said and others, uh, I would be grateful if one of the junior ministers could, could, day, could, day, could, could today confirm again that nothing in this bill undermines the decision-making power of the executive as a whole in relation to Brexit or the implementation of the protocol, nor does it give individual ministers the right to take decisions in relation to that protocol implementation uh, that are significant, cross uh, significant controversial or cross-cutting. Um, and, uh, and with that uh, request, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will draw my remarks to a close. Thank you. Call Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Principal, or Mr Deputy Speaker. Sorry to do that. Um, as I look around us here in the Assembly, it reminds me, if we look back in the history of when RHI was being debated in the Assembly, and even with the reduced numbers here expected due to COVID, the numbers of people here being able to take part in this debate on what is quite frankly bad legislation is particularly disappointing. I don't wish to make this into a particularly uh, moment where we are going to uh, harangue each other on particular issues. But there is some significant issues here. And the first question, and we have not had the answer, is 
Why this legislation? And more particularly, why now? Um, Mr. Lyons, yesterday, and thank you very much indeed for your very fulsome sort of uh, description yesterday and sort of your briefing when we were talking about the amendments. And you did talk extensively about the legal opinion that's come to the executive from the departmental solicitors and even sort of the views of the last Attorney General. And we fully accept, and it's a pity Mr. Stolford isn't here, we fully accept the fact that privileged information to uh, the executive is indeed privileged and shouldn't be subject to further discussion. But we do indeed welcome your offer, as you made yesterday, that the, the solicitors will be able to brief us in more detail. And it's just a pity in this sort of the 11 minutes that the executive committee took to decide on this bill when it was going through the executive committee, there wasn't the opportunity to get some more guidance and advice, particularly on the legal advice that was there. Um, we also know as a party, and a party that, because of the unique situation of Northern Ireland, is in a mandatory coalition, we also need that many of the reforms that were mentioned and were supposed to be part of the new decade, new approach, haven't been brought to the fore yet, and many of those haven't been actioned yet, that here we are in a situation we are looking at a piece of bad legislation and the impact that is going to have. It's not just going to have an impact on this year, next year and the years to come. And as some of our learned members have said who have been here much longer than I, we will be dealing with the implications of this, not just in the short, the medium and the much longer term. And I think many MLAs need to reflect on that. Uh, again, Mr. Lyons referred yesterday, and again, I think it's quite important. He alluded to sort of, sort of three sort of key issues about sort of the checks and balances and controls, which is one of the main reasons why I think this is bad legislation. You mentioned the issue around the three ministers rule and how that refers indeed with the ministerial code. But we have been informed that there's going to be an update in the ministerial code. We're being invited to look at this legislation before we know what the changes in the ministerial code are going to be. And indeed, one of the things from New Decade, New Approach, and as somebody like many other people in this uh, chamber today, sat through hours and hours of turgid discussion behind the scenes in Storm Stormont House and beyond, we still have not seen the updated ministerial code. And being asked to take this legislation through on the basis that we haven't seen smacks again if we go back to the RHI inquiry and some of the issues to do with that. Certainly. I, I, I wasn't involved in those turgid discussions about, but he is right about New Decade, New Approach, and indeed the Ministerial Code. Would he agree with me that, given that everyone in this House wants to see um, Brexit dealt with in a way that protects the Northern Ireland economy in the fairest way, including the implementation of the protocol, would he agree that it's particularly important that we get clarity that the, the implementation of the protocol and Brexit are cross-cutting fundamental issues, and they are inherently significant, controversial. That's why they're included in New Decade, New Approach. So we need that clarity that they, that they won't be subject to individual ministerial um, uh, so it runs. The member from South Belfast, and you must have been reading my notes, because indeed those are the very words I was going to discuss at the moment. Because one of the things, again, not only do we not have any view of what the updated ministerial code is being like, we need to understand clearly what the definitions of significant, controversial and cross-cutting are. And we talk about the issue about improving clarity for ministers. When are we going to see this information so that we would be able to assess whether taking the test of whether this law is a good law or not, whether that was appropriate for doing these tests? And we haven't seen that. And MLAs, if we look back over the past of some of the things that happened and some of the reasons that this assembly wasn't sitting for three years, we can see that the issue of lack of scrutiny, I think, has been very clear. And again, to the First and Deputy First Ministers, and we have to ask this question, does why does this bill help restore trust in the Northern Ireland Assembly? Does it restore openness and transparency? And does it address the demogra or democratic deficit? Ask yourself very clearly, are any of those questions answered? There was a note today in one of the newspapers, and it talked about, are MLAs really incurious and inept? I take that as an. I, I'm quite insulted by that because I am not incurious. I might be inept in some things, and I don't think people in this assembly would consider that. But there is a real issue here because we have a precedent 
of legislation coming through this Assembly. That has brought this place into disrepute. And members of this Assembly, we are doing that again. So, so how does this respond to the challenges of our unique legislative system? This was introduced to sort out a planning issue and a series of planning issues. And as my honourable friend from South Down has said on many occasions, what is the rush? And indeed, I think my honourable friend Mr Muir talked about said there was over 650 planning or 650 weeks on some of the planning applications. Now, one of the great things about being a submariner is I'm quite good at mental mass. And that shows that these planning applications have been in the system from long before the assembly was shut down for three years and long before Buick came. So there's something more fundamental wrong with our planning system than just what was going on with Buick. And I'm not sure that this legislation in any way is going to address some of those fundamental issues. Certainly. Uh, the junior minister, Mr Lands, is obviously quite shy when it comes to me because he has been offered many opportunities to stand and speak and explain the rush. Uh, and he has sat quiet, as has Mr Kearney. And we have Again, could I ask the member to use the, the microphone? Sorry, he has, we have had no... Exp Do I have to go again? The, Mr Lyons must be very, very reticent to speak when I'm on my feet, because he's been given many opportunities through yesterday's debate and today's to explain the reason for the, uh, the rush, the reason why there was only 24 hours, in fact, less than 24 hours given for amendments, and why we're heading at break breakneck speed down a road which may prove disastrous. Now, he has not on any occasion been prepared to intervene when I've been speaking, so I'm offering the opportunity, since you've raised the question, to, 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 to explain why we're doing this. Thank you very much, indeed, and thank you very much, indeed, for that intervention. Well, the away. I shall, indeed. I, I, I am very grateful um, to, to the member going away, though, though I would point out that I did give away multiple times yesterday uh, to the member, and I have, no, I have no problem in doing that, and I may even seek to make an intervention when he is speaking uh, later on as well. The, the, the members want to know why it is that we are taking forward this legislation the way we are today. Now, one issue has already been, been touched upon, and that is the issue of planning. And regardless of some applications have been in for a long time, it's still important that we get the process right. The second issue that we want to make sure that we address is that the significant and controversial issues are not currently allowed to be used. The member should be aware of that. Why? Because we've no programme for government in place. So without this bill today, ministers would be free to do things within their own department that are significant or controversial, and it's important uh, that we do something about that. The third reason why we need to, to bring this bill in is to make sure that there is clarity because I think for some, they're of the opinion that, yeah, well, the judgment might mean that we have to um, bring all of these decisions to the executive, but, but, but don't worry about it. We'll, we'll just let that go. Uh, just because it was the practi practice and custom previously, we don't need to bring it in now. That would be wrong, because as Mr. Sulford has already said, unless, if a minister has to take something to the executive, he cannot make that decision by himself. It becomes an invalid decision, uh, and there's no uh, legal certainty around that. Three reasons why we're bringing this bill in. May I thank the Minister very much indeed for doing that. But I think in his very intervention itself, it continues to raise fundamental questions about why this is bad legislation and a bad law. And I'm sure the junior ministers will, when they're briefing the Assembly at the end of this debate, will talk fairly clearly about the definitions that we require for significant, controversial, cross-cutting and maybe we will also get an update on the proposed new ministerial code. Because indeed, ministers, we are being invited to change this legislation before we even know what the proposed changes in the ministerial code are. But, and I'll conclude fairly shortly, we do have a choice. We as members of this Assembly can either meekly accept bad legislation, which the Ulster Unionist Party will not be doing, do we really seriously say that we're going to allow, allow the so-called smartest lawyers in the room to set the agenda? Because this is all I've heard. I have heard everybody say that we need to agree with this because the best legal minds from the government lawyers and from the Attorney General tell us that that's the right thing to do. And we don't have to go back very far in this Assembly 
to see when the last time we had lots of advice and guidance from departmental solicitors on issues to do with that and where that led us to. That should be something as the touchstone that we look to as we go through. But finally, how does this bill actually give us clarity? I have not heard anything from any ministers or from any of the more eloquent people from the back benches. No, Christopher is very eloquent. I quite enjoy his interventions. No, eloquent. You're never getting eloquent. But the real issue that we have to do here, ladies and gentlemen, members of this assembly, this is bad legislation. In the future, when this comes back, which it will, and creates enormous problems, we have to ask ourselves with our conscience, did we have the ability to stop this bad legislation at this stage? Or are we going to go through another whole rigmarole that's going to create all sorts of impediments to the future good governance of Northern Ireland? And it'll probably not even make sure that we get the York Street interchange built on time. We need to have good legislation. We need to have good scrutiny. And we didn't take the amendments yesterday, but the ministers still have this opportunity to delay this process so we can look at this properly. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed. I call Jim Wells. Mr Deputy Speaker, if you hear a hissing sound during my speech, it's my process of burning many bridges between myself and my erstwhile party. I am fully aware of the consequences of what I'm about to say, but it has to be said. And I can, simply cannot stand by and watch this House take a decision which will have enormous, could have enormous implica implications for the governance of Northern Ireland without at least standing up and warning of the consequences. It's often said that opposing the executive is like jeering at a passing steamroller. And that's probably as about as much impact as I'm going to have. But I want to be able to, to look the people of South down in the face, maybe in 18 months' time, when this radically unravels and to say at least I had the courage to stand up and say we shouldn't have done it. Now, before I go into my speech, Mr. Salford, I'm glad that he's back because he answered a question that I raised about a rogue uh, Sinn Féin minister on a solo run wanting to inflict Irish language road signs on the people of Northern Ireland. And he stood up and said, oh, but that's cross-cutting because it also impinges upon the role of the Department of the Communities. Can we... Uh, yesterday, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, we heard very intemperate and inflammatory language from the member who was speaking there. I see today he's back at the same old lark, talking about rogues and so on. Is there, is there any chance he could be asked to restrain his uh, intemperate language, please? I am sorry I have not heard any intemperate language to date today, and if I do so, I can assure the member I will intervene. Mr Wells. I'm going to say I'm using rogue in the sense of someone who is totally out of control rather than someone of, of doubtful moral background. But what, I'm, what the point I'm trying to make, and we have seen this, of course, because his, uh, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Connor Murphy, did actually introduce legislation to impose Irish language road signs on the people of Northern Ireland. And the reason he got absolutely nowhere with that bill was, as pointed out to him, that under the existing legislation, he, it was going to get absolutely nowhere. Now, Mr. Stolford made the point, and I, I will give way to Mr. Stolford on this, the point he stood up and said, ah, but that affects the work of the Department of Communities. Now, uh, Mr. The, uh, a Sinn Féin, or indeed an SDLP, Department of Infrastructure Minister, decides to have Irish language street names or street road signs between Newcastle and Kilkee. I think it would be very difficult to argue that that is a genuinely cross-cutting measure which will have an impact on the Department of the Communities. And I don't think it will really matter because I think a court will decide that it has no real impact on the work of the Department of the Communities. 
be aware that it has Section 75 implications and equality implications. So if people object to such provision, as I am sure they would, he mentions the town of Kilkeel, I'm absolutely sure they would, they also have recourse to the law. Ministers have to act within the statute. Ministers are creatures of statute. They also have to act within the law. And the parameters of the law are very clear around the specific issue that he raised. This is becoming a pattern with the member, setting up theoretical examples which are designed to frighten people. And it's becoming boring. Well, gosh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've been described as many things in my life, but never boring. Uh, what, 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 I, what, I, what I would, would say to him is that the people of South Down already have experience of this because the District Council have imposed Irish language signs throughout the district. Um, and all attempts to invoke Section 75 have failed miserably. And the council have got full authority to impose those in communities that don't want them. So I wish him well in trying to stop Irish language uh, road signs within the similar restraints. And he, he said to me that I'm throwing up uh, in a rather boring fashion, and I will really have to up my ante if I am being boring. But he's saying, that I'm throwing up uh, sort of false, uh, false alarms, situations where people will, will feel worried and concerned. But the fact of my 22 years experience in this chamber on, uh, in this assembly has shown that these situations do arise, that there will be mavericks, I'll use maverick rather than rogue, ministers on the national side who will attempt, the certainly will, Except the Equality Commission's finding in relation to Paul Gibbons' decision to cut LIFA funding, and that was another way in terms of the legal system which found in relation to decisions made by other ministers. Order members, can I just remind everyone this is not a debate about the Irish language. I would draw everyone back to the bill uh, we are considering today. The point I'd make is that I think a court could well decide that a Sinn Féin or SDLP minister, or indeed even a Lands minister, who wished to impose Irish language road signs on the people of Northern Ireland, had the power to do, this, do that under this bill because it is not cross-cutting. And unless there was a clause within the programme for government expressly forbidding that, the minister would be well within his powers to proceed with that policy, which would be anathema to a large proportion of the people of Northern Ireland to have that. They don't want Irish language road signs. Now, this bill purports to be uh, an updating of the legis legislation uh, to reflect the Buick case. And everybody in here knows the significance of the Buick case. But could I say that I have received many hundreds of emails from individuals over this last 24 hours from people who are even concerned about giving the Minister uh, for Infrastructure the power to unilaterally make a decision on controversial planning applications. And I'm sure other members have also received those emails. For instance, the group opposed to the Dalriada gold mine application in West Tyrone, or the application for a similar development in Armagh. Um, uh, he seems to be now extensive. Several people have issues with clauses, eight, with clauses 8 and 9 of this bill. Several people have, have issues with accelerated passage. I can understand those. He seems to be now drawing a, a broader issue with the infrastructure minister having the ability to make these decisions. Is that, is, does he have a fundamental problem with the idea that the infrastructure minister should, be, should have a clear post buick uh, ability to make planning decisions? Well, what I'm saying is that this legislation has caught many people in Northern Ireland unawares. And many people would have liked to have had an input into a proper consultation on it through the committee, uh, through, I presume, Mr McGrath's committee would have been the, the appropriate committee to have dealt with this. They have been denied that opportunity. This legislation has gone from the printers to ratification and presumably royal assent within a period of less than a month. There has been 11 minutes of consultation about it in the relevant committee. Members were given less than 24 hours to submit amendments. And I sat in the, the chair, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I had to read out to members that if they wished to submit amendments to this legislation, it had to be in by 9.30 the following morning. That's highly irregular. Now, Mr. Lanza said, and I must say, I, I thank him for the fact that he did at last explain the need for the rush. But can he tell me one single decision that would definitely have to be made between now and the first week of October. 
Mr. Um, gentleman from North Down, I forgot his name, I'm awfully sorry. Gen the new member from North Down uh, listed that there was 38 members. Somebody remind me. Mr. Muir. Uh, the, the 38 planning applications that were sitting in the system. But what he didn't say, and what nobody said, is that planning application A, we want to make a decision off in August, and planning, planning application B, well, definitely we need to make a decision in September. The reality is I suspect that when we come back here in October, there will still be 38 planning applications sitting there because that, unfortunately, is the way that things work in the system at the moment. So rushing through this legislation will... I'll, I'll, I'll give Mr Lands the opportunity to name me the applications that are so urgent that they have to be processed over the next eight weeks. I'm, I'm happy to take the offer-up of, of an intervention, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, he hasn't addressed my other two points yet, which I hope that... Which, which, which I hope that he will. Um, but surely the member believes it's right that we have the proper processes uh, in place and that we have the legal certainty that the decisions that we are making uh, are being made in the right way. If, 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 that, if that was what he's doing. But he hasn't convinced me that he is. And I did give him the opportunity to say application A and application B will have to be processed between now and the first week of October. Now, if he's saying that there's no prospect of that happening, then what could be wrong, and he hasn't answered this point, what would be wrong in allowing the assembly, those community groups who have been caught unaware, the general public and the legal profession, an opportunity to have a few weeks, and I mean a few weeks, to sit down and to consider this bill more carefully. Nothing could be lost, but what if he is wrong? And what if Mr Stolford is wrong? Well, the implications for the governments of Northern Ireland are immense because it could lead to judicial review and a legal situation where ministers can prove that under this legislation, they have a right to proceed in whatever way they jolly well like. Now, it's going to be very difficult when we meet members of our community, when things are being done, when ministers are out of control, it's going to be very, very difficult to say that they sat in this chamber and they allowed themselves to be whipped to be vote to vote for something they didn't approve of. Now, I'm aware of the internal workings of the DUP, having been a member for 46 years of the DUP. And I know that there was no consultation with the largest political party in this chamber on this bill until yesterday morning. There was no discussion on it whatsoever until one member, one prominent member of the party, pleaded with the chief whip to have a meeting that was denied. It was only when several members of the party pleaded for a meeting that a meeting was held yesterday morning at half ten. That, and please feel free to contradict me if that's not true. Now, at that meeting, what occurred was there was a lot of concern expressed, a lot of concern expressed, as a lot of concern has been expressed to me by members from right across the board. In the absence of someone much more capable in the form of Mr Alistair, unfortunately, they've had to turn to an obscure backbencher Obscure backbencher, is that on parliamentary, Mr Deputy Speaker? I would just like to draw the member back to the legislation rather than the internal workings of another political party. Because I think most members are fascinated to hear about the internal affairs of the, of the, of the DUP. But they've, tu they've turned, I'm afraid, to, to obscure backbencher marooned in the desert. And unfortunately today is ensuring he will remain in that desert for a very long time. There was a very intense discussion. But what happened was that assurances were given by those involved that, that legally that this legislation was an enhancement of the St Andrews Agreement rather than something that weakened the St Andrews Agreement. And on the basis of that verbal assurance, people have allowed themselves to be whipped to go into the lobbies to vote for something that they are extremely unhappy with but are scared to say so, apart, to me, apart from saying it to me. And there are many people out there tonight, or this afternoon, whose name is on a piece of paper held by the Chief Whip. And he will stand in that lobby and he will shout out those names when many of them are very, very unhappy with being asked to vote for this legislation. So, for Mr. Deputy Speaker, well, no, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I suggest that I have unlimited time because this is legislation? The member is quite right that there is no time limits. But I did give the member some direction to move on from the internal workings of a political party and to refer to the bill that we're discussing here today. 
Deputy Speaker, members are still assuring me they're hanging my every word, so it can't be that boring. Now, subsequent, subs, but I will, I will not down, uh, wander any further into internal machinations of any political party in this chamber, but I do note that nobody from the members to my left has stood up and contradicted anything I said. Now, following yesterday's debate, there has been a huge adverse reaction from the community as to what happened. And many people have taken pen to paper uh, and, and either in social media or in newspapers to indicate that they're deeply concerned, deeply concerned. And most significantly, one of those is Mr. Richard Bullock. Now, I know yesterday there was concern that we quoted so often from Mr. Bullock. But frankly, I have the enormous respect for the judgment of Mr. Richard Bullock. And the fact that on three separate occasions now he's gone public to express his concerns about what we're doing, that holds a lot of water as far as I can, I'm concerned. And no one in this chamber has really answered his concerns. Now, to you younger members of the Assembly, and I know there are people who weren't born when I first sat in this chamber, for you younger members of this, not you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can assure you, but what I can assure you, say, that many of you will not be aware of the significance of Mr. Bullock. In fact, people said to me, who is Mr. Bullock? Well, I can assure you from my experience of St. Andrews, even though I, I wasn't there, was that Mr. Bullock played an absolutely crucial role in the negotiations at St. Andrews to establish the protections that have served this assembly so well. And indeed, it is noticeable that what was agreed in St Andrews has saved our community from some really strange proposals, many of which are still sitting in a store in the executive office, knowing that under the St Andrews agreement, they have absolutely no prospect of seeing the light of day. So that has given us protection for 13 or 14 years. Now, when the, excuse me, when the author and those, the person who was so instrumental in the drafting of that document is saying that he still remains extremely concerned, despite, and I have to say it was quite eloquent, the defence from Mr Lands yesterday at the, at the end of the debate on the issue. And I thought Mr Kearney was remarkably quiet, but Mr, Mr, Mr Lands has been given the, the job of defending this document. But having listened very carefully, as many people listened very carefully to what Mr Lands said, there is still an element of concern. And this issue is so important to me and so important to people in Northern Ireland that even if I'm harboring a 10% doubt as to, the, uh, as to the effectiveness of this legislation, then I think we need to go back and have another look at it. And so what I'm pleading to Mr Lance, who obviously exercises a very powerful position within the Executive Office, I'm pleading with him not to go over the cliff this afternoon, not to go beyond the point of no return, to accept, as Mr Stolford said yesterday, that there is conflicting legal advice on that. And that's the only thing we agreed on yesterday, was that there is that conflicting advice. If there's that element of doubt, which all of the MLAs that I've spoken to have, what would be wrong in allowing this item to be rolled over to the first sitting day of the new session? Now, I will gladly give way to Mr. Lands or Mr. Stolford or Mr. Dunn or Mr. Harvey to tell me what could go wrong by doing that to allow us to forensically examine the comments of those who are opposed to this bill, to see if they hold water. I believe they do, but maybe they don't. But what would be, well, would there be massive planning applications that have to go through by the first week of October? I'm waiting, Mr. Stolford, Mr. Lands. A giving way, but perhaps I could, I could issue a challenge to him, uh, which is to set out why he believes what we have in front of us is in any way a move away from the St Andrews Agreement. Because there are three main issues that we've been talking about today. The first is in terms of an issue being controversial. Uh, that remains. Something being significant, that remains. In fact, those two are actually enhanced, because after this bill is passed, not only will they apply whenever a programme for government is in place, but they will also apply whenever a programme uh, for government is not in place, and that's important. And in terms of the, of the cross-cutting issue, we have moved uh, to, to the position um, of, of what was very clearly the position back at St Andrews. Not interests, not whether um, we, we cut across the interests 
of other ministers, which I don't know, by the way, how you can measure, um, but to their responsibilities. And why is that important? Because responsibilities is the key word. Responsibilities is the, is the word that's not only found in the St. Andrew's Agreement, not only found in the Ministerial Code, but it's also found in the words of the then member for East Belfast, um, Mr. Peter uh, Robinson, when during the debate in the House of Commons um, talked about uh, issues beyond a de minimis level, uh, more than incidental, which are regarded as cutting across the responsibilities of two or more ministers. So can the member explain how this legislation is a move away from St Andrews? The, the, the honourable member for South Down, who probably just about has CSE woodwork, is not the person to comment on that. The point is that when Mrs O'Lone from Tunes, when Mr Jim Allister QC and Mr Richard Bullock who is the author of the protections that we're debating today, when they have considered all of what he said yesterday and all the comments from other members, when they are still alarmed, then that doubt comes into my brain, that doubt. Now, if this was the district council dog filing bill or the litter picking bill and we got it wrong, well, it's not the end of the earth, not the end of the earth. But this is so fundamental to how we govern Northern Ireland, that if we allow it to go through when we still, many of us, have our doubts and it all unravels, then we will never retrieve the situation because the one thing's certain, the members to my right will never ever agree to an amendment. It's like the definition of victims. We can never amend the de definition of victims because we're stuck with it and it requires cross-community support to bring it back to something that people are comfortable with. So, in a few minutes' time, if the Honourable Member for East Antrim, the junior minister, moves this to a vote, which of course he'll win because of the whip system, the scars are on the back of all the backbenchers who have dared to oppose this, he will have a list of names, I assume 26, on a list which will be called out and people will be dutifully registered to vote for something, many of whom are feeling uncomfortable. If he goes over that cliff, and I'm right and he's wrong, then there's a terrible consequence for what's about to happen. Yes, certainly, absolutely. I uh, appreciate the member giving way uh, again. Is the member saying that he's comfortable to be in the position right now where there is no programme for government uh, and ministers are free uh, to, uh, uh, until this bill passes, uh, not to have to bring issues to the executive if they're controversial or significant? What I'm suggesting is that the present legislation has served this assembly and this community very well. And what I'm saying to you, and, he, ha he, and he, ha another, he hasn't answered the point, is anything drastic going to happen between now and the first sitting of this Assembly in October? He has got the power to delay moving the final stage of this bill for a very short period to enable members to have a good, long, hard look at it. He has it within his power to do that today. And I'm pleading with him, not because I'm a dissident DUP backbencher, not because of any axe to grind with the party or indeed any other party in this chamber. I am saying let's make certain we've got this absolutely right before we go beyond the point of no return. I'm not asking him to concede the merits of the bill. I'm not asking him to accept any amendment to the bill. I'm just saying given the extraordinary way in which it's been handled, the total lack of scrutiny that it's enjoyed, the widespread community, uh, community concern about it, and issues which have been raised long after the bill was published and dealt with by the OFM DFM committee, will he not consider a short, and I mean a very short delay, to enable cool heads to sit down and get this absolutely right? I call it Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr Stalford, in kindly giving way and allowing me in earlier on, and got me, me was able to mention without having sight of the legal advice from the DSO and the Attorney General, as well as the majority of other members here will have. It's difficult for me and, and, and uh, my party colleague to see the mer merits of this le accelerated legislation. So I will take some time, despite having spoken yesterday on this and the amendments, as this for us is a very important piece of legislation. I, along with a number of others, have questioned why the executive are intent on pushing this legislation through at this time and also if consideration had been given to what exactly this means for the powers of the executive. 
Certainly, there is still no clarification on the timing issues, no reasons given about why we must have this legislation in effect for the summer. It has been continuously raised, and I will continue to ask this today, like Mr Wells has said, along with Mr Beatty, what is the rush? We are told that this bill is necessary to clarify the circumstances in which a minister is required to refer a matter to the executive committee where that matter may be cross-cutting, significant or controversial. We are also told it is about planning. We are also told now that it is about getting clarity, of which I see none here. So who decides what is cross-cutting, significant or controversial? Will this be set and clarified? Is there a mechanism for appealing? What is more than incidental in this case? What is an interest? And again, how does this relate to climate commitments and our environment, for example? Would impacts on climate and the environment be considered as a cross-cutting matter for a decision to be taken by the executive rather than one minister? Planning decisions that have significant climate impact would naturally cut across many departmental interests and across their statutory duties, such as ERA committee and the minister, the economy, finance, infrastructure and health. One can make the argument that all planning decisions on our built environment can have climate impacts. So where does this lead to in the context of this legislation? And what about the Aarhus Convention? We are told on the 6th of July that there is a number of significant planning decisions that are expected during the remainder of this year and could lead to significant investment and employment opportunities that are being deferred or lost because of this not being enacted. But is there any information on what these actually are? And do these actually lead to employment opportunities like it's being sold to us? And for who? This bill has been proposed as necessary to help government function quicker and more efficiently. But without an agreed programme for government, all potential controversial decisions still have to go to the executive approval. And what if one of those controversial decisions is on a planning matter? Is that still only within the remit of the Minister for Infrastructure to take on their own? This has been famously and controversially invoked before, five years ago, over the BMAP. And yet this pl planning policy is still waiting for executive approval and is now out of date. So the process is here yet again. Accelerated passage was sought for a piece of legislation that is at limited scrutiny and no consultation, a recurring pattern over the last few months with regard to mostly coronavirus-related legislation. But now we are told that if this is not resolved quickly, it ca could have important consequences for the economy and particularly our pressing need to promote investment and our infrastructure. We are told that the committee agreed the need for accelerated passage in part because of the current COVID-19 pandemic. And, but if this is so, and so important for investment in our infrastructure, why was this not brought as soon as the executive was reformed earlier on this year? Why now? Why during what is supposed to be recess and we are here today attempting to pass this piece of legislation with no scrutiny time? The bill on the surface is about planning decisions and has been stated that this is stemming from the Buick judgment on the incinerator. But does the passage of this legislation open us up to unintended consequences and has this been considered? And as I said earlier on, um, and Mr Stafford was uh, kind enough to give, me, give way to me, we have no information. I cannot make an additional judgment on this because I haven't seen the legal advice. I will. To accept that not only have we not got the legal advice, and I do accept what Mr. Stulford has said from the previous as a minister, I accept that ministers do not normally release legal advice that they've been given. But does she also accept that the ministerial code and so many of the definitions that are crucial for the implementation of this bill, we haven't seen the wording. We've been asked to vote for this blind, we've been asked to vote for legislation, and then the important bits will come along afterwards. And that could create chaos. Again, surely an argument for a slight delay. The, the Minister for his intervention, and I would accept that we don't have the legal advice, as the, as the member will, will already know, and also accept that the code is crucial here. Uh, it seems to be a bit cart before the horse for me on this one, and I'm sure the member would agree with me on that. Um, so, does this further deepen silo mentality, silo decision making by the ministers and their departments? Many members commented at second stage about the need for quick decisions to be made on planning applications in the system and those currently on the desk of the Minister. But are quick decisions the best decisions, especially when it comes to the planning system and developments on the scale, size and impact that we are discussing here? I will. There are concerns that I and others have, I'm sure she may have as well, that the planning process often excludes people, ignores their voices and doesn't include them in the process. 
I thank the member for his intervention. I would absolutely share the concerns um, of the planning process. I think it is uh, too many barriers for people, uh, not enough consultation, not the right sort of consultation, and certainly we would be pushing for equal rights of appeal uh, within the planning process. But as I'll, I'll continue, this is not actually about the planning process, this piece of legislation, and we have a lot to do on that. Yes, we have experienced long waits for planning applications through the system, and Mr Muir has outlined some specifics that is currently with the Minister for Infrastructure, and most members will have experience of other issues with our planning service, of which there are many. But this bill isn't going to change that, and Mr Wells is correct, probably the first time I've agreed with him in this chamber. What, but what major planning applications will be made in the next few weeks that could not wait until after summer recess? Are the executive telling us today that there are a number of hugely important planning applications literally waiting to be signed off by the current Minister for Infrastructure, but can't be done without this legislation? And I, I will. Yes. Living way. In yesterday's debate, uh, Mr. Wells referenced the Casement Park development. The member, I'm sure, would agree with me that actually what happened in that case was not that a ministerial decision was made but that the local residents, in conjunction with their assembly member, campaigned and used the planning system to prevent a bad application from going ahead. So actually the suggestion that a minister could simply impose such a decision isn't valid. I thank the member for his interve uh, intervention. Mr Wells can reference whatever he wants, as we know, um, and he's already done so. And I don't have the specifics on Casement Park, even if it is part of, of this elusive list that is on the minister's desk. So just to reiterate, if this was so important for all these long-standing applications to be progressed and the, lead, the need for this legislation, why was this not one of the first pieces of legislation that the executive brought in February? Why was it not in a new decade, new approach? Because I see no reference to it there. The role of this House is to scrutinise and take decisions on our legislation that need to be taken throughout these so-called unprecedented times, and we have been denied our full scrutiny role through the use of accelerated passage. Now, some legislation was needed to be enacted quickly over the last few months. And, but I don't see the urgency needed in the same way that, say, the private Tennessee's coronavirus mo modifications bill was needed to ensure people were not evicted during the COVID pandemic and lockdown, which was an immediate and very real threat faced by many people here as we implemented the health protection regulations. This has again been presented as a technical bill that is only about planning issues, but it's actually... I will. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for giving way. Um, as this debate has gone on, I think one of the key things here we have seen is it is about the planning process. The planning process needs to be. Could I ask the member to address the chair? Sorry, I, I, my apologies, and I'll take my. The process is the planning process is the problem. It's not about giving ministerial authority for it. It's about the planning process. So why are we introducing bad legislation to deal with something that's not even dealing with the problem? Sorry. Member for his intervention, and I would agree the planning process does need completely reformed. I would look forward to any engagement on that and any input that I can have on that. Um, but again, this legislation has been posed about planning issues, but actually, for me, why it opens up a very big can of worms that we may not be seeing down the line. So this is changing the Northern Ireland Act, and yet we have little detail on what the consequences of this might be, apart from it being painted as great opportunity for future employment, which is highly questionable and raises more than a red flag. But is this it? What else does this do? Through this bill, if the executive has reduced cross-cutting to mean only when a significant impact on another department's statutory responsibility, what, this does, what does this mean for previous legal obligations to work together? such as on the Children's Services Cooperation Act? What impact on outside planning at all has been looked at and adequately tested legally? Have unforeseen circumstances been correctly thought out? And like I stated yesterday when speaking on the amendments, we should be encouraging better collective and collaborative working, not giving departments covered to plough ahead with working in silos. New Decade New Approach stated that parties are committed to working together, reflecting new ways of working to ensure that the executive is transparently and collectively accountable to the Assembly and to the citizens. 
But for me, this is not what this legislation is an example of. This is bad government and bad policy will flow from it. We have had no time to consider the full implication this could have. It is supposedly to stop the executive from becoming a de facto decision-making body for planning applications. So why was this entire bill not limited to planning? This is bigger than it's made out to be, and we need time to properly consider it. There is still no justification for the accelerated passage. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Green Party will not be supporting this bill. There are too many questions and far too few answers. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am um, not going to repeat the many concerns that I have raised repeatedly about this bill already. Uh, but at the final stage, I think it has to be stated that it's very concerning that not only is this bill being proposed, uh, but it is being proposed at breakneck speed and likely to pass. Uh, the junior minister stated, or certainly indicated, uh, that controversial planning decisions will still be heard at the executive committee, and much like um, my colleague Ms. Uh, Rachel Woods, uh, I don't believe the question has been answered. Who determines what is controversial, uh, and therefore properly heard or discussed? Um, the executive. Uh, and since yesterday, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, Ms. I and uh, many other uh, Assembly members, I assume, have received a lot of emails uh, from a number of groups and individuals, some have been re referred to already, concerned about this bill. I think it's notable uh, for two reasons. The first, that so many people raising serious, uh, serious concerns with MLAs uh, about the environment and the skipping over uh, of an element of the scrutiny process have raised concerns about this bill. Uh, that so many have contacted the day before the final uh, stage of the bill. I don't think that's an accident to me. That indicates that the many of the public, I will, yeah. Uh, would the member also accept that in many of those emails, the Our House Convention was cited, and yet in none of the contributions made by Mr. Lange or Mr. Stolford have they actually sought to deal with that issue? Are we in contravention of the Art House Convention by doing what we're about to do? And I would be very interested to hear whether Mr. Kearney or Mr. Lyons, at the end of their, uh, this debate, will actually answer that fundamental point. I thank the member for his intervention. Uh, they did. I don't claim to be an expert on the, the convention, to be frank, but it was raised with me, and I think the answer need, the question needs to be asked: Are we in breach of it uh, with the passing of this uh, bill? Many people have raised this concern. I think it needs to be directly answered uh, by the junior minister. I refer back to my point before the intervention: um, the fact that so many people. Uh, contacted MLAs the day before the final stage of this bill to me indicates that um, many, most of the public uh, did understand the content of the ramifications of this bill. Even some LA, MLAs have stated honestly themselves they didn't understand the, you know, the, fur, uh, the full ramifications of this bill and, and fair play to them for being honest. Uh, so there's serious, serious, serious concerns in the fact that people are raising so many the day before this bill there should be a warning sign to MLAs. Um, we, we heard from uh, Pat Sheehan about the economy um, needing to get going, and you know, in, in abstract, that sounds correct, and you know, in abstract, there's no problem with it. But you know, you can't rip out an important aspect of accountability when decisions are, are made by ministers. Uh, and I, I think we we'll have to emphasise the fact that there are fundamental problems with uh, planning. Uh, some have been referred to uh, already. I think the main problem with planning is that people are excluded from the process time and time again. Objections are often ignored or not addressed uh, properly, uh, and this bill does nothing to uh, deal with those uh, issues. Residents are often ignored, Casement Park residents for one. Uh, environmental campaigners are often ignored, dismissed uh, as well, and this bill actually compounds that problem, does nothing to uh, address it. Uh, and what, I, what I'm hearing for some uh, in this debate uh, is that you know make plan on the, or make building decisions, build things, and if there's concerns, then sure, so be it, or we'll deal with them after best case scenario. That's not good enough for making decisions around planning or anything else. Uh, somebody once said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, never waste a good crisis, and it seems Stormont uh, hasn't waste, wasted the opportunity to use a health pandemic uh, to remove an important aspect of scrutiny uh, when it comes to big decisions. And for these reasons, I will be opposing this bill today. Thank you. I now call on the junior minister, Declan Kearney, to conclude the final stage of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I want to acknowledge and thank 
the Assembly for its willingness to consider this bill by accelerated passage. It's certainly not the preference of the joint heads of government to progress legislation in this way. However, due to the urgency of the need for decisions on planning applications in particular, it has been necessary to bring forward this bill in a much faster time than would be ideal or desirable. And even in that short time scale, a number of important issues have been debated and members have uh, been given the opportunity to voice both concern and also support. So this final debate will bring to a close the Assembly's consideration of the Bill, which remains unamended as of yesterday's proceedings. And in so doing, it will help to enable the appropriate decision-making by the Minister for Infrastructure on planning applications that, as others have pointed out, will aid in our economic recovery from the midst of the health emergency caused, caused by, if you just let me finish my sentence, caused by the COVID-19 health emergency. Uh, may I thank indeed the junior minister for giving way. Um, you've alluded to a planning decision and planning decisions that are in the process of coming through. We've heard from many members asking for a, uh, guidance from yourself or the other junior minister of what some of these planning decisions may be. Uh, could you perhaps give us some information on that, which may help us sort of make up our minds around the debate? I well, thank the member for that intervention, and I, and I will take it at face value that it's a genuine question, and I was intending to revisit, I was intending to re revisit those issues as I respond to both your own intervention, your own contribution, and those of other members uh, who have spoken during the course of the debate. So, I would like to thank all of the members who have uh, taken the opportunity to speak today. Go and buihas, Leshna Kolti Arfad, Aglak Parch Ensign, Jisbarak Chon, and I am grateful to you all regardless of what position you took in relation to uh, this issue for your contribution. So, Elias Jan Korlia, Jana Maljervas and Nish are in major duru, Ig and I will take this opportunity briefly to uh, address a number of the comments made by members in the course of the debate. Christopher Stalford uh, commenced the debate and stated that the legislation uh, being brought before the House is consistent with St Andrews. And he affirmed the legal opinion uh, received. Uh, I agree with you uh, that uh, members are absolutely entitled to challenge and critique. Uh, th that is the challenge function of this assembly. But I also agree that the legislation does provide clarity and has the potential, and I believe will be seized as potential, to increase collaboration within our five-party power-sharing executive. And I would also go further. I think that the legislation will be enabling in that respect. And, and if all five parties who have seats at the executive table, and most of them are represented uh, in this chamber today, uh, take that opportunity in a positive, constructive way, then I actually think that this legislation can assist in that process. Mr Stalford also observed that uh, all of the relevant arguments have been made and, in his view, scrutiny has been achieved. Pat Sheehan then spoke and began by highlighting the, the consequential legal hazards which were created as a result of the Buick ruling. And in his view, he believes that, the, and I agree with him in this respect, that this bill recalibrates the legislation. Uh, he, however, as many other members did on both sides of the debate today, and, and in particular Mr Beatty, uh, the, there are limitations in relation to accelerated passage. He noted the limitations of that, but that it is in the circumstances that we face uh, a necessary position to adopt. Yes, go ahead. I accept the points made by Mr. Carroll that for hundreds of community groups. Order, order. Could I ask the member again to ensure that he stands beside <laughs> the microphone? Sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I keep making the same fundamental error. Would the honourable member accept the, the, the information given by Mr Carroll that for hundreds of community groups throughout Northern Ireland, the first that they were aware of this legislation was when they turned on their TVs yesterday and heard the debate on it. They've been caught totally unawares and have had no opportunity whatsoever to have an input 
into this vital piece of legislation. So how can he defend his premise that indeed there has been adequate consultation? Well, I thank the member for uh, your intervention, and the point that I made was that Mr Stalford had opined that, in fact, we have subject this legislation to substantive uh, scrutiny, notwithstanding the fact that uh, we are operating uh, with a system of accelerated passage. But I would remind the member, we are all representatives, we are all constituency MLAs, we all have a duty to be accountable not only to our constituents but to inform our constituents. And given the fact that uh, this now has been in the making for a period of weeks, we have all individually and collectively and as parties had ample opportunity to appraise our constituents of the pending legislation. Colin McGrath spoke then, and he began by reminding us all of the, the multifaceted nature of the emergency and the need for us to uh, reboot our economy by finding stimulus measures, particularly in respect of uh, large-scale capital infrastructure projects, which will have the desired effect, we hope, of creating much-needed employment and new employment as we move through the torrid times we have been living through. He believes that uh, this legislation, as I indicated uh, earlier, uh, will help the executive to work better, but he emphasised the importance of action and the importance that the executive is seen to deliver for the benefit of wider society, and on that basis he indicated his willingness to support the bill. Doug Beatty then spoke. and. Uh, and, and, and I want to affirm his opening remarks. He noted the quality of yesterday's debate, uh, to which he made a very substantial contribution himself. And he did express offence at, at some of the comments that uh, were made yesterday, uh, which, which uh, he felt were personalised. He suggested that the bill was a carve-up uh, between the two largest parties represented within our Assembly. And I know that Mr Beatty will accept my point, my response, in the fraternal manner it is intended, but I would remind him that uh, our power-sharing executive, our power-sharing government is made up of five parties, of which your own party is one, and all ministers supported this bill as it proceeded through the executive, and all ministers were, of course, cited on the advice that was provided uh, to the executive in respect of how to deal with the issues which require to be remedied. He did, however, say that... Yes, please. I appreciate the minister giving way. Could the minister just um, return to his, the comments that he's just made? Because in the debate yesterday, it was implied, if not stated directly, it was implied that one minister in the executive was not in agreement with this bill. Is the junior minister stating now that there was unanimity at the executive in this bill coming before this House? Well, I thank the member for your intervention. Uh, certainly I can, and I don't intend with respect to uh, the confidentiality of uh, executive business, and I certainly wouldn't betray any of such confidences, but I have no record of any discord or rancour within the executive in relation to discussions around these matters. <laughs> yes, OK. I think it's important because uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have had already discussions about the internal workings of the Northern Ireland Executive. We have already had discussions about executively privileged legal information that we are not cited to. Are we in a situation here where we have got two parties are trying to use this situation to demonstrate that they are going to use the internal information of the Executive that is supposed to be confidential for this debate, when in fact the conventions are that they do not do? And just for a matter of clarity and record, in fact, it is a mandatory coalition. It is not a, uni a normal democracy situation as we have. The Ulster Unionist Party has a seat in the Northern Ireland Executive because of the Belfast Agreement. That is why we were there. That is why we have got I thank the member for his intervention. And, uh, on that point, we will depart. I am pleased to be, member, uh, to be a member of our power-sharing government. My party is pleased to be sharing power with other parties. Uh, and clearly, the, uh, the, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party has some qualification, reservation, doubt about uh, the issue of power-sharing and the logic for us having power-sharing, for us doing politics on this consociational basis. And, and I hope that it doesn't telegraph an intention on behalf of his party in relation to maintaining the collegiality of our power-sharing government.
But to return to uh, Mr Beatty's comments, he did say that it was bad legislation in his, in his view, and he expressed a concern that it will, as a result of passage, uh, create a situation where the executive and its business may become more combative. And, and on that point, I would seek to reassure you uh, that with, with a commitment on behalf of all ministers, with a commitment on behalf of all five parties who have seat, uh, seats at our executive table, I believe that the commitment can exist to ensure that power sharing works. The issue of making our power sharing government work, in my opinion, is not so much about whether we pass this legislation or not, though I do believe that it will have an enabling function. It is, in fact, about the will and the spirit that executive members come to the uh, executive table with in terms of trying to map out a better future for all of our society. And it is on that basis, I think, as the uh, minister representing the Ulster Unionist Party has on many occasions stated in recent months that he appreciates the level of collegiality, support and uh, assistance provided to him in his work, very important work in leading the fight back against COVID-19 from all other ministers within the executive and I would add from assistance, assistance from other members of the executive both within executive meetings and without, out with executive meetings as well. So, uh, yes. Uh, thank the member for giving way, and considering you've given way for, for quite quite a few times already, so I, I thank you. And I take face value uh, your beliefs that um, this legislation uh, will, will will keep that collegiate um, executive, and and, and I, I accept that. I accept that in good faith. But uh, what I would say is that our executive has been doing a good job, but it's been underpinned by a ministerial code, which is quite expansive. And the issue about cost crudding is quite expansive in there. You must agree that when we pass this bill, that that subchapter 2.4 is now going to have to be changed and be less expansive. And because it's less expansive, it may need more conflict within the executive. And I guess that's the point I was trying to, trying to make. Member, for your intervention, and, and yes, I mean, thank you. In, in terms of accepting what I have said at face value, I can reassure you and your party that it is my resolve and intent, and not of my party, that we will seek to work in a collegiate, continue to work in a collegiate way with other members of the executive, including uh, your own party colleague, who is Minister for Health. In, in terms of the ministerial code, and, and, and uh, I was intending to uh, address this issue. Later in my remarks, yes, there are matters pertaining to the ministerial code. Yes, the ministerial code will require to be amended. The ministerial code cannot be amended until there is passage of the legislation. An example of how we will address the, uh, the uh, uh, ministerial code and the required amendment consequential upon passage of this legislation relates, for example, to functions. Uh, we, will, we will need to amend functions within the executive to ensure that that is reflected as statutory functions. But it is in the context, and uh, just let me finish, please. It is, it is in the context of, uh, of, of, of this discussion and in terms of minister, ministers' adherence to the ministerial code for ministers to make their own assessment in relation to what is deemed controversial, what is deemed significant. And the first and deputy first ministers will determine if an issue is significant and retain in the context of this legislation the capacity and the prerogative and the, and the prerogative to call matters in. Yes, briefly, please. The, the Honourable Member for South Antrim, the junior minister, shouldn't be concerned about there being numerous interventions because this is such a crucial issue. Just a, a couple of points he made. He said that OFM, DFM could make the decision. Of course, they'd have to agree jointly to make the decision to call in a matter. They, they couldn't disagree on the issue. So in other words, if one party decides it's not appropriate to bring it in, it, it won't happen. Secondly, he made a point which I found somewhat surprising. He's saying it's essential that this legislation has to be passed, I presume he means today, in order for there to be discussion on the ministerial code. What would be wrong 
in delaying the final implementation of this legislation to allow the ministerial code, the revised ministerial code, to be uh, published, and also the definitions, which are so important to this legislation, to be out for public consultation. He hasn't answered, and Mr. Lands hasn't answered the, the fact, and nobody has produced these mythical planning applications that have to be dealt with between now and October. Can he answer why it's inappropriate to have a short delay to allow more scrutiny of this legislation? Well, I thank the member for that intervention, and uh, at no stage did I imply that I was concerned or frustrated about the number of interventions at all. I simply suggested that it might be helpful to be brief in order that I could finish making my remarks in response to what Mr Beattie has, has said. But uh, you are absolutely right. There, there is a requirement for us to use every opportunity in the process of uh, this legislation's passage to subject issues to appropriate scrutiny and debate. Uh, this is an opportunity for additional scrutiny. I absolutely agree with you on that point. But returning to Doug Beattie, he, both he and uh, Steve Aiken raised the issue of timing and the fact that we are using accelerated passage. And to that extent, then, this point uh, re refers back to one of the elements of uh, the, the last speaker's intervention. And I think we have to set all of this into the context of the last period of months. Our power sharing executive was re-established uh, in the second week of January. We're now at the end of July. Within a matter of weeks, the, uh, the new executive, the new power sharing government, was engulfed with the scale of managing COVID-19. And the consequence of that was that NDNA, New Decade, New Approach, and all of the provisions within that document, to which every party in this chamber made a contribution, has effectively been placed on ice. We have not yet had the space to design a programme for government. That also has been effectively placed on ice. The existential catastrophe of COVID-19 has effectively absorbed the focus and the attention in a whole of government basis. And, and I say that with respect to the fact that every member elected to this assembly, on the basis that they are constituency representatives, have also been absorbed with the scale of demand arising from COVID-19. And it has actually only been in recent weeks that with the imminence of the transition period for Brexit coming to a conclusion, to, to, to refer back to a point made by Mr O'Toole, that the executive has managed now to begin to start to address the, the scale and the complexity of issues relating to uh, withdrawal from Europe within five months before the transition period actually concludes. And the Department for Infrastructure Minister brought this matter to the executive uh, several weeks, perhaps a couple of months ago, as, as an issue which she believed required attention for remedy. She made the point that it was essential that there was legal clarity obtained. The executive discussed that matter. The executive, in turn, commissioned the legal opinion that was required in order to try and position ourselves to have the clarity and the ability to address with the Department for Infrastructure Minister planning issues which, as Mr Muir pointed out, total 38 within her entry, with some of them obviously being of a greater eminence and significance. Therefore, with, without accelerated passage, and I have said already, and I have said previously, it is not the ideal way of doing government, but it is the mechanism that exists in order to assist government in trying to navigate and manoeuvre circumstances created as a result of unintended consequences. And for that reason, accelerated passage was commended with a view to ensuring that the legislative basis existed and specifically to avoid a situation where we would not see planning issues drifting into next year. And 
That takes me to Mr Muir's contribution, which he began by pointing out that, uh, uh, during which he pointed out that there are almost 40 applications with the Department for Infrastructure sitting parked at this point in time, along with so many other elements of government which we have not had the capacity or the ability to address as a result of everything that has impacted upon us over the course of the last four to five months. Mr Muir pointed out that we cannot afford to wait any longer uh, on this matter. He, he, he made the point, and it was ec it's an echo of what was said by earlier contributors, that this legislation does go back to pre-Buick and post, <coughs> excuse me, and post St Andrew's agreement. And, and I agree with you that it does in fact uh, strike the correct balance between the role of ministers and also the, the collective and collegiate basis of how the executive should do its business. Uh, I've already touched on this matter, but you did raise the issue of the ministerial code, and I can assure you that, yes, it will be updated. But in terms of your, uh, your question as to whether planning issues can proceed prior to the amendment of the ministerial code, then the answer to that is no. The ministerial code must be adjusted in order then for the planning issues to proceed. So again, when we factor in timeframes and time scales to how we're trying to do our business here, then there, are, there, there, there is a process that we are following. Uh, there, is, there, there is a process that we are following, which is an attempt to try and get things expedited, but mindful of the point that there are a number of steps which need to be taken. And the danger with not proceeding with accelerated passage is that the can is kicked up the road until later into the year. And then we are left with the prospect in 2021 of only then having the ability to deal. To, 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 w w when I have finished my sentence, Mr. Wells, if you don't mind, but, I'm sorry. Order, order, well, if you keep order. interrupting me, with, Mr. Wells, I'll forget what sentence I'm trying to articulate, please. And we end up with a situation then where in 2021 uh, we, uh, we have not, in fact, advanced any of the planning issues that we would hope to address. Yes, please. The Honourable Member has let the cat out of the bag. The Member has said that planning applications cannot be considered until the new ministerial code has been adopted. So therefore there's no rush. Obviously that's going to take a significant amount of time to devise, to publish and consult upon. So there's no reason whatsoever why we can't have a delay in the passage of this legislation to enable for adequate consultation and uh, public debate upon it and for analysis of that legal the various legal opinions because at the end of the day, it w it pushing it through today will not facilitate any planning application because it has to run in tandem with the new ministerial code. So why can he not allow this issue to be discussed again the first week of October? I thank the member once again for his intervention, but he misses the point. The legislation must be passed and adopt it in order for us then to make the necessary adjustments to the ministerial code. And on the basis of making the adjustments to the ministerial code, when we have concluded that process, then we're in a position to start to address a number of the planning issues coming through from the Department for Infrastructure from, from that ministry. Yes. This place came back at the beginning of January of this year. And if this legislation is passed, then the ministerial code will have to be updated, and then that will have to be passed. Some members are talking about delaying things and the passage of the legislation to October. Do you not, does the minister not agree that it would be a damning indictment of this place that for the whole year of 2020, there would be a likelihood that not one regionally significant plan application would be passed? Well, I thank the member for his intervention. And, uh, Yes, you make an entirely valid point, which is, is the point that I have been trying to make, and I, and I have attempted to uh, re respect the, raises, the issues raised by members in relation to timing, accelerated passage, why, as some have suggested, why the rush. But you do make the point that, yes, uh, when the amendments are made to the Ministerial Code, these will be brought back to the Assembly, and they will be put to the Assembly for scrutiny and potential amendment, which further adds to the process that we are involved in to get us to the stage where we are, in fact, on a fit-for-purpose basis in a position to deal with a number of the planning issues which remain extant. 
Matthew O'Toole spoke then, and he expressed his own caveats about uh, accelerated passage, and I, I've already indicated that I, I agree. Uh, this is not the best and the ideal way of uh, doing business. But he also raised the question then in relation to uh, the uh, Irish Protocol and whether it in turn also carries uh, cross-cutting implications. And he asked, will the, uh, the, the legislation impinge upon the collective decision-making process relative to the, uh, the Irish Protocol? And I think that this is a point which, uh, which has been uh, raised by the member before, and, and perhaps he has also received a response to the point. But the executive uh, deals with uh, uh, Brexit in a collective format. All of the issues relating to withdrawal are brought to the attention of all ministers within the executive, and we deal with them on the, the basis that this is an issue which requires the collective focus of all ministers, notwithstanding differences within the executive in relation to uh, withdrawal or other ways, Brexit or other ways. The reality is that we are where we are. We do have the Irish Protocol that needs to be implemented. It does have cross-cutting ramifications, and the executive is focused on dealing with those discussions in a collective way. Steve Aiken spoke then, and he began by expressing his concern that the legislation is bad and with uh, long-term consequences, in his view, uh, on the basis that if bad legislation is passed, then there can be unforeseen circumstances with negative results. He expressed doubts about what changes to the ministerial code will entail, and, and uh, I have uh, attempted to address that issue, I think, with regard to remarks made by some other members. Uh, but to, to make the point again, we are not in a position to amend the ministerial code, and it will require to be amended until we actually have changed the law. But, 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 but our Assembly, as I said a short while ago, will have the ability to approve those amendments. And, and I guess this ministerial code is becoming quite an important part. And if you look at section 28A uh, of the Northern Isle Act 1998, there's absolutely, at subsection 3, there's nothing there which says you have to wait for legislative change before you can amend the ministerial code. You can change the ministerial code now, put a draft before uh, this assembly to allow people to see what it will look like, and that would add to the bill that you're bringing forward. Can, can you see the, the concerns? And, and, and the more we dig into this, the more it absolutely smacks at me that there's more scrutiny required, is if we're pulling out things like that. Well, yes, I, I do accept that the member has his own particular, his own very specific concerns around this legislation. He's made that very clear. You've made fulsome contributions yesterday. You brought forward your amendments. Regrettably, those amendments were, were not passed from your point of view because they did not, in fact, secure the majority required and, and did not persuade members that, in fact, uh, they were going to be of benefit to the quality or the substance of the legislation. Yes, Mr. Wells. Uh, sorry, to, sorry to be awkward, Mr. Uh, Mr. Junior Minister, but but we are we have homed in on an absolutely vital issue here. You have said, and Mr. Lands has said, that you cannot amend the ministerial code without passing this legislation. There is no legal advice. There is no law that says you cannot amend the the ministerial code, regardless of what you do with this bill. But also very important. If you amend the ministerial code, that has to be approved by this House. That won't be done, obviously, until the autumn. There may well be amendments. There will be several stages to that. So therefore, the main rationale for you rushing this bill through now to get planning applications falls in its place because you can't do it without an amended ministerial code. That can't be done until the autumn. So why can't you allow this bill to be scrutinised further and bring it back at the same stage as you're dealing with the ministerial code. The member for his uh, intervention. And, and again, he, he misses my point. We are attempting to create a situation where we are in a position, come the autumn and early winter, to address the extant planning issues 
which have been congested for the Department for Infrastructure. The amendments need to be brought, for the, to, brought to the Assembly for agreement in terms of the Ministerial Code. They must reflect the law, Mr Wells, otherwise they will have no standing. So you, in fact, are attempting to take the, the cart and put it before the horse. So, no, Mr uh, Wells, I, I want to con uh, continue with my, uh, my response to Mr, Mr. Reagan. So, in terms of uh, where I left off, and in fact, Mr. Wells's intervention was just on that very point, the, uh, the examples that will require to be addressed in the context of ministerial change, for example, relate to those statutory functions, and specifically the provision of the exemption of certain planning decisions from the cross-cutting issues affecting the executive. But Mr. Aiken did. Uh, and he was quite emphatic about this. He echoed what was said by Doug Beatty, sought further delay in relation to the legislation, and, like Mr. Wells, suggested that there was no valid basis for not allowing uh, for further delay. And, yes. I think one of the crux of this discussion so far has been about the ministerial code. Obviously, if you've gone to the, the speed of going, pushing this bill through accelerated passage, there must be a draft ministerial code out there that you're expecting to come through. Could the minister, therefore, publish that draft ministerial code so all MLAs can have a look at it and decide where this is, needs to go? Because I think, from what we've heard today, that is something we do at least need to see from this executive. Well, I thank Mr Aiken for his uh, intervention. And I have instanced two of the examples which will require amendment and will be subject to discussion and will need to be brought to the Assembly for the Assembly's assent and in the event that members feel that there is a requirement for a more expansive amendment to the Ministerial Code, then the opportunity will exist through scrutiny and through debate in the Chamber for that to be done. Jim Wells then spoke and he conflated his concerns with this legislation with the potential for either a Sinn Féin or an SDLP or for an Alliance Minister erecting Irish language signage and without community support. And he once more raised the haste of the legislation, and I, as he has done, uh, and I absolutely respect his democratic right to do so. Uh, excuse me, Mr Wells, you have an awful habit of trying to make an intervention, and I'm halfway through a sentence. But uh, what I was trying to say uh, that uh, he, he, he did once more raise uh, his concern, and he has done so throughout this debate, and he did so yesterday, uh, about the haste of the legislation, and he expressed his misgivings uh, on the manner, uh, due to the manner that that is happening. Yes, please. Articulate, but he does use very long sentences, so it can be difficult at times to ascertain exactly when he's about to finish a sentence. So it's not an intention to disrupt his uh, flow of thought, as it were. But he has raised the point that I alluded to earlier about a minister uh, wanting to inflict Irish language road signs on a community without their support. And that's happened already in South Down with the District Council. Now, Mr. Stolford raised the point that that couldn't possibly go, he couldn't do a solo run that because it was an issue also for the Department of Communities. Now, he didn't, in my opinion, answer adequately how exactly it is significant to the Department of Communities or indeed any other department and how in court it would stand up that it was significant and how we could stop a minister doing that. Now, he has an, a very good opportunity at this point to explain why my concerns and the concerns of many unionists in South Down could be assuaged, that that couldn't possibly happen because of this legislation. I just don't see it, and neither do many other legal experts. The member refers to road signs and then refers to the experience of his constituents. He knows that he is comparing apples with oranges. What you're referring to is the corporate marketing used by the council. That is a council decision. It is not the road signs, the directional road signs. The sign pointing people to Kilkeel is not in two languages. The member knows that, and he is conflating one with the other. Does. 
Well, I thank both members for their interventions. Uh, just con chóir a Margiel, gór agus Margiel, onas go bhfuil mé gur in Yahana Hawain. Ní glacam sa ar chorbhí gur cheart go gór for suas, cór hí sráide na cór hí boíre, an áitir bí nuair nach bhfuil an pobal tilte na glacúlais na cór hí sin. Just con chinnar aliad. So to briefly translate, as a Gael, as a Gael gór. For not one moment would I countenance the notion of erecting Irish language signs or bilingual signage in locations where they are not want or are they against the will of the local community. So it is entirely fallacious on your behalf, in my view, to conflate your concerns with this legislation in relation to the issue of Irish language signage. And I actually think it betrays more to do with the uh, approach that you have brought to this debate than it does any seriously serious or thought or considered approach to trying to ensure that we have good legislation in place. And in fact, you're not too bad yourself, Mr. Wells, at making long-winded statements and filibustering. You've made a fair good fist of filibustering your way through yesterday and uh, by the appearance of things also today. You, uh, you also raised the context uh, sorry, the context of this legislation has been set out, uh, but you will also know in your concerns and uh, 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 criticisms about the use of accelerated passage that the scheduling of this bill is in actual fact an assembly function of which you are a member. But then you have proceeded, I think, characteristic of your approach to this debate to suggest to members of the DUP uh, that they preferred that some members of the DUP preferred to speak to you instead of their own party officers. And pe people will make people will make of that statement what they will. But I can certainly suggest uh, that it is absolutely immaterial to the nature of this discussion. But you repeated the view that this legislation should be parked because you are not persuaded by, by because you are persuaded by the legal opinion of some of some and of course as has been said throughout today and yesterday and previously everyone is entitled to their opinion including lawyers many questions have been posed by yourself but notably you have not answered the question relating to the logic of this legislation in the absence of a programme for government, which I explained earlier was part of the context which led us to a situation, the invidious situation, where we were absent the legislation that was required to ensure that we could, in fact, proceed with the planning issues which remain extant. Rachel Woods then spoke, and she reiterated her concerns, and, and she has done this before. Uh, but she reiterated her concerns about accelerated passage and, and did so in a very succinct and a very clear way. I, I agree with the member that climate issues are, of course, and can be of a cross-cutting nature. Uh, and I think that that's reflected, the sentiment of that is reflected in New Decade, New Approach, because for the first time we are actually seeing a whole of government focus on the climate crisis uh, that affects our society. And, and our global village. She asks why this legislation now and not at an earlier stage. And uh, uh, with the indulgence of, of uh, Rachel Woods, I, I hope she accepts that I have tried to address that. Um, she suggested that the, uh, the, the, the minister, she raised the issue of ministerial codes, uh, uh, the ministerial code again, uh, and the amendment subsequent to legislation. But as I think I explained, for a number of members, it, it's not in fact possible to deal with the, the ministerial code and the amendments for that unless and until they are consistent with the nature of the law that they are designed to, that they are designed to reflect. Yes? I thank the Minister for giving way and just the, the Junior Minister stated earlier in his comments that all parties in the Chamber had input to the New Decade New Approach document, which is incorrect. Not all parties here were part of that. But to the matter at hand, um, with the comments made by Mr Beatty, Mr Wells and Mr Aiken, out of interest, what is the basis or advice to the Executive stating that this legislation must be enacted before the Ministerial Code is amended, given that no application can actually be progressed without this? What happens if the Ministerial Code is not changed in the way that is needed? Needed for further scrutiny by this House, given a change in the code can be subject to amendment. I thank the member for that intervention. And you're right, 
Uh, but again, I made the point. The issue of amendment to the ministerial code will be required to be subject to scrutiny by the Assembly, and that provides members an opportunity to assess whether those man amendments are in fact robust and effective, or whether they require further alteration. Yes. Just very quickly, could the, the two uh, ministers assure the Assembly that uh, when this revision of the ministerial code comes forward, uh, there won't be any form of accelerated passage on the discussions of it? I thank the member for that intervention, and I'm sure that his own uh, minister and our power-sharing government, uh, under the advice of his party leader, will in ensure that those remarks are passed on to the executive on a collective basis. Um, the member, uh, Rich, sorry, Rachel Woods, uh, said that, uh, suggested that the legislation is not about planning uh, and criticised the, the planning uh, process. And, and I agree with you. I mean, every aspect, and I'm on record as having said this within this chamber and outside, every aspect of our governmental process, including planning, which is so essential, needs to be further democratised, needs to be subject to greater levels of, uh, of transparency and scrutiny. But the point is to overlook the fact that the, uh, the scrutiny process to which the Minister for Infrastructure will herself or himself be subject in relation to any issues which he or she brings forward at any time in the future, including with the address of the extant issues within their, within their, uh, within their uh, inbox. And I, I, I would just point to the member again, the context of recent months. That's not camouflage, that's reality. Everybody here has lived it, and it has put a cart and horse through our approach to the normal approach to good government and how we make decisions. But you are, no, no I won't, Mr. Wells, but uh, you are right to emphasise the need for better and more collaborative working, and even though your party is not a member of the executive, your party. Has a, has a challenge function to perform within these institutions to ensure that that is continuously maximised and achieved. And to that extent, I draw a correlation to Mr Beattie's position, because while we disagree, I absolutely affirm and agree with his right, whether as an individual MLA or on behalf of his party, to provide the challenge function in relation to this debate. Uh, but I, 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 but I agree. No, Mr. Wells, I won't be giving way. I'm trying to bring the debate now to a conclusion, and you've had a fair crack of the whip several times. I, I, but I, I, I agree uh, that. Uh, sorry, I, I, I disagree with the member that uh, this is going to incent. This is going to. This is going to incentivise silo point working of order, within Mr. the Wells, executive. Point of order. Point of order, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, throughout all this debate, the Minister has failed to produce the advice that he's received that he must pass this legislation before amending the ministerial code. He hasn't. Will he produce that? Because that's an absolutely crucial aspect of this debate. <coughs> the member ought to know that that is not a point of order. Junior Minister. But I understand the, uh, the member's concerns uh, in relation to silo working. That is something that the executive on a collaborative basis needs to ensure does not happen. And as a result of this legislation, if it is embraced with, with the correct spirit, I believe it will go some way to ensuring that we do not revert to silo working. Jerry Carroll was the last speaker of the debate. And he pointed out multiple concerns that had been raised with him uh, over the course of the last 24 hours uh, about the, the imminence of final decision making in relation to uh, this legislation. He, he said that he does not believe that the bill remedies the lack of transparency within our planning process. I have already made the point that, that I think we always need to do better uh, in respect of scrutiny and transparency in respect of planning issues and much more. Uh, he suggested that the pandemic was being used as, as some form of camouflage uh, for sleight of hand. I would disagree with the member in respect of that point. I, I, I do not see where he is coming from. We will, we will agree to politically disagree, but on this particular point, I just do not understand the, uh, the, the logic for that. But he does, but he does raise... Uh, 
appreciate we're disagreeing on that point, but I'd like to ask the Minister, does he have any concerns that there may be health decisions uh, taken down the line that aren't considered uh, significant or controversial, but could be, um, may not be discussed at the Executive Committee, and his party may not have the chance to disagree, vote against their challenge? Not privy to uh, the inner workings of the Executive, but it's a concern that certainly has been uh, flagged with me. Well, I thank the member for that, that, that intervention, and, and I am content that the uh, clarity that is going to be introduced in respect of cross-cutting issues will provide the type of reassurance that uh, I hope the member will be content with. You, you did also raise a question around the ARIS Convention, and, uh, which requires consultation on, on a range of different environmental matters. But this bill actually reaffirms the position of decision-making uh, on planning pre-Buick. So, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I want to conclude by uh, commending all of the members for their contribution uh, to, to this debate. Uh, I hope that myself and uh, my fellow uh, Minister have done our best to try and allay concerns, to provide, addi to provide additional information. Uh, to uh, persuade members that, in fact, uh, this is the correct position to take. But I appreciate the fraternal manner in which the debate has taken place here today. Agassiz Marial or Shingo Mullimsa, Donchonal and Billia, I commend this bill to the House. Goramaygat, Elias Kiankoria. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Point of order, Mr Wells. Deputy Speaker, I believe this actually is a point of order, unlike my last intervention. Could you please explain the ramifications of what is about to happen. Is it possible for this legislation to be put on hold and a final decision delayed until October? Or are we putting ourselves on a trajectory which means that if we go to a vote now, there is no way back and this bill will become law? Or to put it another way, is it possible for the two junior ministers to adopt a procedure which would enable us to come back to this in eight weeks' time? The member should be aware that at the start of this debate the motion has been moved and having been moved we now face a decision and members have to take their decision accordingly. So the, the, uh, I'm not aware of a procedure to stop the vote once the motion has been moved. So the question is that the Executive Committee Functions Bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. I would remind you that you should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. Before I put the question, I would again uh, remind members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that the Executive Committee Functions Bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Do we have tellers? Order members. The following tellers have been appointed tellers for the eyes, Pat Sheehan and Harry Harvey, tellers for the nose, Jerry Carl and Jim Wells. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. It's important that during any division, social distancing in the chamber continues to be observed. And in order to facilitate this, I would ask the following. Any member in the chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the chamber to which they are sitting should leave the chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. 
Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the chamber until the division has concluded. However, any member who needs to vote in both lobbies should not leave the chamber. I'd remind members of the need to be patient at all times and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies, the assembly will divide eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order members, members take their seats. Clark, please read the result. 71 members voted, 58 members voted aye, 13 members voted no. 11 members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. The final stage of the Executive Committee Functions Bill is passed. The bill is passed. The bill is passed.